much. Uh, welcome to this Economy, Environment, Infrastructure Committee. Um, initially, welcome to Pauline. And uh, is Willie in yet? No, uh, for their first meeting. I, I know there was apologies at the last one, Pauline, but welcome to the committee. Um, I will remind members that this is a strategic meeting and any ward issue should be taken up by the appropriate officers. Uh, and can you ensure that your phones are turned off to silent? And again, I'll remind members that this, this will be recorded and it'll be available for public listening. Um, can I ask for Cedar and apologies, please? Good morning. We have 17 members present. We are quoted, and so far I have received apologies from Councillor Hagman. Councillor McComb, have you had any other apologies? Yes, Councillor Brodie. That's noted, thanks. OK, thank you, thank you very much. Um, members, um, bef before we go into the agenda, um, I'd just like to say, and I will speak at the end of the meeting, this is Alistair's last meeting, as Director E and I, so I'm, I intend to do a little bit of a spiel at the end, if that's okay with yourselves, uh, a little bit about history and things like that with, with Alistair. Um, are there any declarations of interest? Thank you very much. And we'll go on to item number three, as a minute of previous meeting, the 22nd of January 2019. Uh, therefore, approval. I'm happy to move, though. Yeah, second. Thank you. Um, item number four is a minute of the Harbour Subcommittee meeting the 14th of February for approval. Thank you. Um, we then go on to item number five, which uh, is the Economy, <coughs> Environment, Infrastructure Revenue Budget Monitor Report 2018-19 for the period ending 31st of December. This report provides members with an overview of the key budget monitoring issues in the revenue account and projected performance against budget for the current financial year based on the position at 31st of December 2018. The report also includes... Uh, a sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm just uh, conscious that um, and I'm not starting in the way I intend to continue, but uh, Harbour Subcommittee, I think it would have to be one of the members who was present at the meeting who would second. Councillor Ingalls was present. Was you? Beg your pardon. My mistake. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the report also includes a recommendation from the Harbour Subcommittee to the setting of fees for the Council's Harbours that this committee ratifies the fees increases for 2019 and 20. I'm pleased to see that, that we are projected to break even, but there are still discussions ongoing with the Education Department with regards transport costs for, for extra pickups. Uh, I, I do believe there has been some positive discussions going forward as they are the service that asks for the, the service, but we have to pay for it. Uh, so that discussion is ongoing about where do we shift that budget in, in the future. Um, Alistair, do you want to add anything to it? Uh, there's nothing to add to the report at this uh, time, Chair. Thank you. Members? <laughs> okay. is, is there no questions? Stephen? Yeah, okay, so um, just on uh, what we've been asked to do at 2.4, it was just to get a sense of what the, what, how much that would affect um, the offset, if you like, in terms of uh, the income that would be generated from the change in charges for uh, um, the harbours, the use of harbours fees. So obviously that will have an impact on, on you know, what we're able to generate. Uh, yes, obviously, if um, oh, Stephen's going to. In terms of what's proposed, and it's been through the Harbour Subcommittee, Harbour Subcommittee uh, uh, take a look in some detail at the costs of running the harbours for the council, uh, all of the, the costs associated with the five council harbours, and all of the income generated. And over a number of uh, sessions with them, uh, reviewing the kind of revenue uh, budget uh, and the income. Uh, they have agreed that they want to increase the harbour charges uh, over an, a number of years uh, to try and bring down the, the, the deficit between the cost of running the harbours against the income that's generated. And they also are mindful of the kind of costs for the adjacent uh, facilities and other, other authority areas and that we're, we're tracking against those. 
So it is, it is a kind of modest increase year on year that we're looking for in terms of the harbours fees and charges, uh, and that will feed back into the harbours account and kind of offset the, uh, the kind of increase, the greater cost to the council uh, of running the service than we do generate an income. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's uh, perfectly clear now. Um, so I think it was really just to get a sense of um, what that likely predicted increase in income would be. Right, I don't, I don't have a figure for that. Uh, we can, we can certainly calculate that based on past usage. Um, we're saying that these are modest increases, so we wouldn't expect that we're going to, we're going to push custom away. Uh, so that, that there will be, a, there will be a surplus. But that's something we can certainly, we can calculate and feedback through. Uh, Harbour Subcommittee. Graham, uh, Malcolm. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. How do our fees compare with other authorities um, with similar types of harbours? The, the details reported, when, when we look at increasing the charges uh, with the Harbour Subcommittee, we do uh, normally include an appendix to that report where we match against uh, the likes of the, the, North, uh, so the, uh, the North Solway English Coast uh, and the kind of Clyde Coast. And we tend to be competitive, particularly in relation to the Clyde Coast. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot higher patronage and demand in relation to the, the kind of central belt. So we are, we are, we are competitive and, and economic. Uh, we certainly don't want to drive away any business at Kirkubri. That's, that's important to us and important to the wider economy in terms of the landings at, at Kirkubri. And we certainly want to continue and, and, and develop our, our, our kind of leisure and, and uh, commercial uh, fishing interests at Stranraer. So I would say that we, we are generally competitive. Would you like to come back? Yeah, just when you say competitive, do you mean cheaper or do you mean the same? Cheaper. We've identified uh, a number of years ago that we were uh, um, cheaper uh, than, than other facilities. Uh, and we, we understand that at some of the Clyde uh, locations can probably charge a, a premium. Uh, that, 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 that there's a greater demand. Uh, and what we've done over time is, is increase those charges uh, to move towards closer to what other, other facilities uh, and other authorities are charging uh, without uh, trying to damage uh, the, the level of patronage that we have. So we are trying to close that gap, but yes, I would say when I say competitive that we are, we are cheaper relatively. Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, your, your prices are definitely very competitive. Is it still the situation that you've got a waiting list for Stranraer and for Kukubri? And uh, is there any movement on that? I, I understand the detail for Kirkubri is that yes, there is there is a waiting list to get on the the pontoons, and there are a lot of the uh, leisure vessels uh, will have will be on the mud flats that when the boats will dry out and the, and the boats will be moored there, uh, and that there is there is a quite a long list to get on to uh, the pontoons at Kirkubri. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of the kind of recent uh, position on on Stranraer Harbour in terms of marina, but I know in the past. Uh, the, the, the demand has exceeded the capacity that we, we have. I would imagine that's still the case. And I think there's always been in the past that bit of pressure. The, the final pontoon nearest the breakwater at Stranraer has always been maintained for visitors uh, so that there is, there is something there empty for day trippers, particularly through the summertime. Uh, and in the past, there has been that pressure to try and let that out to uh, year-round lets, but we've, we've, we've tried to maintain. So I would say that there is... Uh, certainly, uh, looking forward in terms of any expansion to the marina, uh, that, that we would uh, we would benefit from additional capacity in the future. Come from uh, so the, the fact that there is a waiting list does that not suggest that the potential there would have been a bit of scope for higher charges for the pontoon berths as opposed to the swinging drying moorings? Yes, and I think I think and over time we have we have looked at increasing those charges, and I think the decision. The Harbour Subcommittee has been to do that on a, an incremental basis uh, and uh, in, increase the charges and, and eventually align them with uh, adjacent authorities. Did you want to come in on that point, uh, James? If that's okay, Chair, it was just to pick up a Harbour Sub um, <clears throat> in January of last year and reported again in November of last year. There was, uh, there was a substantial increase in fees uh, the previous year. So this last year, we've, this coming year, we're looking at a 3% sort of an inflationary rise. But in the last year, the, the pontoon birthing fees were increased uh, uh, 10%. And we'd already increased landing fees from 1% to 2% for our, you know, our catches, principally at Kikubri. So we'd seen some substantial increases in previous years. 
and so we're we're, we're managing that that increase this these current years. So. Okay, thank you, Jim. Go on. Thanks, Chair. Uh, with reference to the top of page thirty-two, what is the definition of a small fishing vessel? <laughs> Not a large one. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> the, the majority, Chair, the majority of the fishing vessels at Kikubri are, are berthed at the, the larger vessels are berthed at the, the, uh, the key. Uh, we keep the smaller vessels away and we allow them to berth on the pontoon. So rather than uh, charging them the rates that go with that, because we're taking a landing fee from them as well, their rates are different than the vessels would be if they were a leisure vessel. So it's the smaller vessels, fishing vessels that can berth on the pontoon at Kikubri that, that get the, the lower fee. I couldn't tell you an exact length, but it's the sort of two or two man operation vessels, not the large vessels. Welcome back, Jim. Would, would these be hobby fishermen, you know, weekend fishers, or would there be an element of commercial fishing? I suspect it will be an element of, of commercial fishing, creels and such like, but I, I could, I mean, we can speak offline and I can have the Harbour Master chat through with you the details of that as you, as you see fit, if they wish to speak to me afterwards. Thank you. you happy with that, Jim? Yeah. John? Hey, thanks, Chair. The infrastructure and transportation has uh, overspend on page 21 of 514,000. Over the page it says, due to increased expenditure associated with potholes at 4.1.3, it says this budget will have an additional projected overspend of 83,000. Is that roughly, or could it be even higher than that by the end of April because of the amount of work ongoing with filling potholes? Don't Obviously, um, Councillor, um, we have a variety of um, factors that impact on this budget, uh, not uh, least the weather, which we have no control over. Um, obviously, um, potholes, as uh, anybody who drives down the A75 will know, have increased. Um, there is pressure on this budget. However, um, the um, staff in the roads department are managing um, it, to look at it as and restrict the expenditure as much as possible and are at the moment only f um, filling in potholes that are of uh, critical importance. Um, also, they have reviewed expenditure and capitalised um, those things that are appropriately capitalised. So we're hoping that that is the maximum, but obviously um, that is dependent on factors, some of which are completely out with our control, like the, the winter weather. So it's, a, it's an estimate. Okay, thank you. Stephen? So I'd like to the same point, uh, Chair. Um, I mean, looking at the table on page 21, obviously it's encouraging that there's a break-even uh, projected if the uh, you know, measures are, are progressed as, as hoped. Um, but there is that, um, on the surface, you know, you could look at that and say, well, uh, there's an underspend or an under recovery or over recovery in some areas, uh, and that's been off. That's to offset the overspend in other areas. You know, so does that mean some service areas are are uh, effectively not getting everything they ought to because other services aren't keeping within their budget? So, um, however, uh, just a wee bit of confirmation: do, uh, is it us that carries out the repair works to the A75? Okay, it's a chunk road. So, okay, that was just a wee bit of clarification there. Um, and, and so. With these things in mind, and obviously this is a monitoring report from uh, from previous, um, can we get the assurance that these sort of variances um, are sort of taken into account, obviously, as we're moving forward into the new financial year, so we've got a more accurate um, uh, indication of what we're going to spend and that that will match the budget we're allocating to it? Alistair? Yeah. Uh, let me just think, get, get, get the, the, the drift of your question. Yeah, going forward, we, we, we will obviously uh, match the budgets uh, to, to next year and, and, and the expenditure will, will be contained within these. Uh, A75 we, is a trunk road, so we do maintain it. I think uh, Caroline was just referring to the fact that 
uh, like all roads, uh, even the A75 is struggling. Uh, the, the, the overspend of 514 in infrastructure and transportation includes the 83 uh, for the road pothole, so just to confirm that, that includes that in the total. Uh, and as we go forward, we, we, we're taking various uh, measures to, 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 to try and bring this back to, to even. Uh, one of the, the, the issues, and it's the first bullet point uh, on page 22, is, uh, is associated with the, sorry, the second bullet point, the residual costs in relation to the trunk roads. Now that's, that's ninety ninety thousand pounds included in that five fourteen, and we are still attempting to recover that. So hopefully we'll be successful uh, in pulling that back. We've restricted expenditure to only critical items. Uh, that's not necessarily services, but critical items within our business. Uh, and we are having discussions with education and Paul Garrett as to where the overspend on the the, the school transport will sit. Uh, that totals £311,000 uh, £311, at the moment, and even if we split that with education, that, that would certainly go a long way to make sure we returned a balanced budget. So we're working hard to pull that back, and hopefully we'll cover that 125 before the final out term. <coughs> Members, can we go to the recommendation? Sorry, 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 sorry. I did say before he came in, welcome Willie, but you, you won the in. Uh. Thanks for the kind words, Archie. Uh, I, it's just on that last remark by the, the director, and indeed that's moving into this 2018-19 and overspend, and it would be imagined that it'll be the same for next year. And it's really, uh, you know, in terms of kids that are needing to be transported to school with additional needs whether indeed we've taken cognizance of that in next year's budget, even if it's still being attempted to try and bring it into line with this year's. It's just on, on the other remarks being made by Malcolm, Malcolm Johnson, in terms of the marinas, both in Kirkubri and Strona, with particular reference to Strona, whether indeed we are maximising the potential uh, in the number of baths uh, and how the marina is managed. And I know of in some of the other marinas up and down uh, the West Coast, they work on the principle that if a, marina, a yacht is sailing out for a period of time during the summer, then they can get a reduced annual uh, fee, but the council or, or, or the marina, the marina would then have the potential of uh, letting you know, so many further baths. Uh, likewise, I'm not at all sure that the six baths that are at the top of the, remina, uh, the marina are really needed to lie empty for the space of time that they do, notwithstanding they do suffer uh, northwesterly winds at that particular spot on the marina. Uh, also, on, on that, uh, and it's to the bottom side of, of the inner harbour, there was at one time £70,000 laid aside for more uh, safety uh, ladders or, or, or uh, walkways to access the inner harbour. And that has never been completed. Uh, the, the people who use that part of, of the harbour have to do so by 90 degree ladders. And that's where some of the, the smaller fisher fleets, fishermen, use that particular side of the harbour. Could, could I ask where that 70, or, or indeed, I think it was 70,000, actually has gone and why it's never been, that project has never been completed? Stephen, come on. No, I'll check on that and come back to the councillor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you answer about the question about the better use of the marina? It's certainly something we can review if you've, you've um, if it's identified that there's um, other ways that uh, we we can increase capacity. Certainly, we're open to feedback from the users of the the, the marina, and I know the, the regional harbour master meets with them and 
and that's certainly something we can we can have to have them discuss with them okay can we talk into the microphones because some people are finding it hard to hear Malcolm, did you want to come back in here? I just come back in the point that uh, Councillor Scobie's raised there. Uh, I know other marinas, what they would do is if a, if a boat was away for an any extended period, um, the berths are then reused for visitors. And normally what would happen is they would actually then split the visitor's fee. That's the normal credit that the, the owner would get when their boat was away. So we'd, you're basically using up, because a lot of people in Stranraer will maybe go away for a month or so in the summer, and that creates a, another visitor's berth, which is which is always handy for bringing tourists into the into the region. Okay, you want to add on to that, Graham? Yeah, just um, if we've got a waiting list, and I understand it's about 40, 40 boats at Stranraer, and the waiting and there's oversubscribed at Kirkubri as well. Have we any plans to expand to put more pontoons in, more uh, berths? Stephen. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, colleagues in economic development probably can speak uh, better to that in terms of the proposals for the marina expansion and where they are with the kind of business case for that. But that's certainly something uh, that we would support uh, in my service in terms of uh, getting additional uh, usage out of the harbour. Well, just, just on a couple of points here, obviously, there's a, there's a bit of uh, digging that you've got to do, a bit of research that you've got to do, and particularly the, the £70,000 that Willie, Willie spoke about. I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to get a report back to Harbour Subcommittee on that um, to, to, to ensure that that, that can be um, scrutinised and, and, and make sure the governance is in place for that. Could that be done? Yeah. Thank you. Good. Well, but there's no further questions. Go to the yeah, recommendations. Yeah, the, overspend, the overspend in transport uh, has recognised been taken because I can see that being reduced in 2019 20. Has yeah. that recognition been taken of that? Alistair. Yeah, th th there's no doubt that we, we have to, to, to look at this budget and relocate it. At the moment, we administer the budget, but the decisions on its expenditure are, are all carried out by head teachers as, as they have their needs to transport children. So I, I think there's no doubt that, that, that this budget, it certainly would be my recommendation that this budget goes back to education. Uh, and we look at how they look at how it's spent, how it's administered, and how it's managed. We are not in a position to be able to say well, as soon as we went into overspend, stop spending, because we're not in control of, of the needs that, that the education authority has. So there's no doubt. I feel I will, I will recommend to Paul Garrett at the end of the year that, that budget is transferred back to the appropriate uh, appropriate service to manage and operate and control the decisions that are made on it. Okay, members, we've got the recommendations. We're asked to note 2.1, note 2.2, note 2.3, agree 2.4. Thank you very much. Now we'll go on to item uh, 6, which is Infrastructure Capital Programme 2019-2021. This report provides members with information on the proposed Infrastructure Asset Class Capital Programme for 2019-20 and 21-22. It also provides details of the schemes to be undertaken during 2019-20 within the capital programme for approval. Further members are asked to consider the off-site infrastructure project associated with the new Dumfries and Galloway Acute Hospital and also agree to the implementation of a new policy on road asset safety inspection. Uh, the Head of Infrastructure and Transportation will take any questions on the report unless you've got anything to add to it, Director. Uh, nothing to add at this stage. Chairman, thank you. Members? Ian? I would start off, uh, Chairman. Four points. Uh, some just looking for detail, if possible. And it was the first point. I'll get to the first. It's made about 3.41 to 3.47. Talks about road safety uh, inspections, so on and so forth. 3.45, I see there's a table there. And we're looking, obviously, for improvements. We're taking a risk-based approach as we go forward, uh, a new methodology. But look at the inspection. So the existing frequency, if you notice in the top table, for roads in particular, without looking at the footpaths below, now we see there's less inspection. So it just some kind of reassurance in regards to, well, that kind of automatically could come to the conclusion, well, if we've got to inspect them less, we've got to have less understanding of the state of the road infrastructure, so therefore we'll not be able to react in the proper time. But 
obviously there's a wider uh, plan to this, just to get reassurances from, so I've got four points, so for that for that point... So, that so do you want to take one point at a time, or do you just want... Um, I'll just give you the whole point yeah, and come okay. back, if that's okay, Chair. So at that point, yeah, it looks in the, at the face of it on that table that that's, we'll see a detriment to that, because of the road inspections being less frequent, uh, if we agree the proposal. Page 64, uh, at the top of page 64, if I just get there, Chairman, it refers to a particular job, it's, uh, I think all the Annadale South uh, members have been lobbying on this one, but it's the U126A Powfoot Coastal Infrastructure. Is that in regards to White Road? Just so we're absolutely sure it's White Road, so there's, I don't know if there's got to be gabions or sheep piles, whatever, putting there, but the road's moving into the into the shore just, to, as, just before you get to Powfoot Hotel. So just a point of clarity in regards to that, because it isn't absolutely clear, it hasn't been pinpointed. Page 67, uh, road safety issues, nothing Andy or Lestale, just an ob observation. You thought there would have been something in regards to road safety issues, got a number... I could certainly refer to, I think, a, a local route. And I think page 73, like I say, just to kind of get maybe the ball rolling, Chairman. When it comes to, used to be our safer routes to school, and we see there's a table on page 73 at the bottom there, there's a list of schools that haven't had anything done. Should should we be looking at getting some kind of report back at some time soon, like, okay, can we facilitate these in some way, shape or form, even if it's a 20s plenty, as some kind of small mitigation to perhaps help towards that low uh, has, a, has an effect, certainly help mitigate towards safety issues, but at uh, low cost, I should say, Chair. So the four points are there. Uh, Aileen, are you answering this, Amarim? Um, in terms of inspections, yes, that will reduce the current number of inspection routes that are carried out, but um, at the end of the day, the staff will still be out on site. Um, looking at roads and covering customer reported defects, so they will still be travelling the roads and picking up other defects as they see them when they're out there looking at customer reported issues as well. So if you don't mind, Chair, just, do you think there'll be any detriment is what I'm trying to get the assurance on? Do you think we'll still put the inspections as proposed and we go to that level, then Graham, will that have any detriment in, in uh, the car and the, the works being defects, so on and so forth? No, I, I, as I say, I think at the end of the day, yeah, if we're getting customer reported when we'll be out there travelling these roads in any case, and they can pick up, still pick up the defects the same. This is basically a formal recording system, if you like, so that the, the defects have been recorded on a specific time basis, and that will help us support any insurance claims, etc. But I'm confident the staff are still out there and will pick up other defects as they see them. Any other questions? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and the, 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 the section of uh, coastal protection you mentioned, uh, Councillor at Pau Foot, that's a, a, a section in particular uh, east of the hotel towards the main sharp bend in the road. It was brought to our attention by the local residents some time ago through our uh, local roads colleagues, and we reported it back in uh, January uh, to this committee that we were working on that. It's a continuation of that. But we're, we are also generally looking along the coastline there. Um, to see if there are any other measures uh, that, that are needing attention as well, but specifically the area outside the, the cottages. Okay, any other points? Yeah, with regards to the road safety programme, uh, there's no scheme has been identified in Arendale Nestdale that's uh, after the trawl that was done over the last three years. There was a couple of schemes done in uh, Annandale um, last year, and whilst there's nothing identified at the moment, we will monitor, and if any uh, suggested sites um, get suggested by members or Police Scotland um, or, or members of the public, then they will get added. It just so happens there was none identified through the accident trawl for this, for this year. And with regards to the, the final point about the 20 miles an hour at schools, the sort of the priority and that the policy was set back in, I think it was 2012, the 20 mile an hour speed limit policy. And back then the policy was just to move through the list of schools based on the school rule. And I think there's now 22 schools uh, left. A lot of them are the, the smaller schools. But every year as part of the accident trial, we do look to see if there's been any incidents, accidents or anything involving uh, pupils at these schools. And if they did, then I think you're right with the, uh, the suggestion about the 20s plenty. We could look at providing something or whether we could elevate them further up the list, dependent on anything actually happening at the, at the schools. Okay. 
Will they come back in? Just on that last point, no. Delighted to hear that last piece. I think if we've got some low-cost options that for the perception of the public and it does increase again, the safety and safety concerns that are being raised, it, it addresses them. I think it's something we should be looking at. Maybe we can address that through a report coming back at some point in the future, Chairman. I think it's uh, because of the budget constraints we're under, we should be looking at all options. Okay, I mean, I know the one that came forward, which wasn't the only thing, was the rig one, because uh, that was a, a big concern. Um, we can certainly look at a future report coming back on the 2020 split. I think the last one was about a year and a half ago, if I remember right, something like under 20, uh, 20 mile an hour. There is some discussions in COSLA at the moment regarding the 20 mile an hour zones as well, so I mean, that, that might be a benefit to actually have the outcome of that for COSLA in, in the report as well. Jim? Uh, thanks, Chair. Page 55, second line down. You don't need to worry about it, chaps. It's just Queen's Drive is Thornhill and Queen's Road. Sankara, just clarify which one it is, please. And the point I wanted to raise, Chair, was uh, page 41, 3.35, the contaminated land remediation. Investigation has been completed and the report will allow a remediation strategy to be developed. Alistair agreed some time ago to bring, in the future, a, a report on the status of the contaminated land areas that we have. So I accept that that will happen sometime in the future. Just with Alistair moving on, I wouldn't want that just simply to be lost in the ether somewhere. I presume that will come because there are contaminated land areas across the region and I think members should know. And I imagine it would be an exempt report again because confidentiality is important, but uh, we need to know the current status of it because we can't have some remediated and others just left at uh, remain as they are. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously there's an exempt report on, on one of those particular items today, and there was, was a report done on that, and it's for health reasons more than anything else, but there is a, there is a wider um, yeah. look at the contaminated land area, and a report will come forward at a later date. Yeah, and I'm content with that. Chair Alistair gave that assurance, and he did say it was sometime in the future. So there's no issue, I just want to make sure, <coughs> that although we're losing Alistair, we're losing the experience, I wouldn't want these other things just to go astray. And, and the other point... Good morning. Good morning, thank you. The Queen's Drive Sankar site, I'll get back to the exact details of it, exactly where it is, I'll let you know exactly where it is. That's great, thank you. It's not an issue, it's just uh, we don't have a Queen's Drive in Sankar. Of course. Sean then Jim then Duke. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of points. The first one, um, I know we've got the published programme there, but also we have reserve lists as well, and I don't know if they've been collated, but not for the report, but if members could maybe have a copy of the reserve lists, the reason is that I was expecting, I think, Port Street, the final phase of that for surfacing down to the harbour. I would have expected that to have been there, so I just want uh, reassurance that it's on the reserve list. And the, and the second point is with regards to the 2.5, it's the, the road asset safety inspections. Um, obviously, very comprehensive uh, strategy and manual. Uh, one thing, and I think we've requested a number of times is if it was if there was a possibility i know it's on page 117 it talks about the inspection records being kept on an app uh, and i just wondered if members have access or could have read only access to uh, inspection reports because in times when we're asked at community councils or other forums we're asked you know um, a state of a road and we asked for the council to undertake an inspection on that road but it'd be handy that we could interrogate in our own ward the state of roads, etc. So we appreciate that, you know, when someone does report, we can see see that. So I just wondered if, if there is the possibility of having read-only access or if we request uh, a specific um, inspection report on a specific road, whether that can be furnished to us. Uh, we'll need to investigate that and come back to you. Um, whether it's possible or not, you can check out, get back to you. Can I just ask, so if we don't have read-only access to the app, could you also look at the fact, if that's not the case, then if we asked for an inspection report, because in the past, when I've asked for an inspection report, I've, I've not been given them. So if there's a facility to actually download that or send that link or something like that, or a printout, uh, or you know, if that could be done, that would be appreciated. And and on the reserve list. 
Um, just regarding the wider asset management element of it, we're actually looking at analysing the inspection information and other information we've got on sort of a wider basis to sort of build the whole capital programme. And it's something we've done in the past and we're building on it. So we're trying to bring in as much information as we have and as much information as possible to get the best um, results from the information we hold. Um, regarding the, um, the reserve list, it's again not something we're publishing um, due to duly, sorry, the aspirational element of it, that there are other things that are jumping up the list. Um, so that is why we don't have an official reserve list. We need to sort of look at all the information we have and all the schemes and where everything can sit together as a whole project. That's why we don't hold specific reserve lists at the time. So in that case, if there's no reserve list at the moment, it would be okay if, if we had a specific question on a specific road, then you could kind of say where it is on the list if, or if it is on the list. It's probably better doing it that way, yeah. If you've got a specific query, we can sort of answer it and sort of see where it might sit. But regarding the reserve list, we don't hold one as such because of everything else that's happening and the changes. And it is very much a live process with the changes in the, in the sort of the nature of the asset. Can I just ask something on that? Because it was certainly agreed uh, one of these committees uh, maybe a year ago about the third part of Port Street because it was like the, the you know, I, I know Ian used to talk about the Taras Road and I'm going to talk about his ward now. So um, the, the actual Port Street, is it planned? I don't honestly have the information on the specific uh, site, so it's something that I can get back to you both on. Okay, thank you. Jim McComb? Thanks, Chair. I note at 3.38 there are new proposed projects for the countryside. My concern is, are we in a position to maintain the infrastructure which is currently in place, let alone bring in new projects? Director. Right, right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, th this, this is a capital report, so it's capital money that's been expended. We do have revenue money to look after the current court path network, etc. So my answer would be yes to your question. We, we do have the ability to, to, to maintain what we have already. Albeit uh, that uh, the, the, the funding is stretched, we do prioritise the maintenance that we have to carry out. and. Uh, we take that seriously and deal with it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you want me to come on? So, I have a reassurance, Alistair, that we have sufficient funding in place to maintain this infrastructure. We have sufficient funding in place to maintain the infrastructure on a prioritised basis, not on a total uh, preventative basis. We'll have to deal with the issues as they arise. Uh, Duke then, Willie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I've been away the last couple of weeks. So I was a co-pilot in a new uh, Virgin spaceship. When I went away, before I went into space, one of the biggest problems in this area was roads and the, the lack of maintenance in them and drainage and such like. So you, you, you'll have to forgive me when I came back down to Earth to realise we were cutting uh, the roads' budgets by such a considerable amount over the foreseeable future. Uh, appendix 1, page 47. Carriageway strengthening, plan structural overlays, carriageway resurfacing, and the list goes on. Is there a question in that or that statement? Why? Stephen? That's... I mean, Appendix 1 summarises the budget allocation that's made available to uh, EEI committee uh, for this capital programme. And we obviously have a large number of programmes in which to, to spread the, 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 the funding across. Uh, it does, uh, has increased in, uh, with additional funding uh, in planned structural overlays next year and the year after. Uh, but the baseline is, is about 9.5 million. The, the other increases, the 10.7 in 18-19, shows an underspend from the previous year and there was additional capital carried forward. This is, this is a proposal for members uh, to, to agree in terms of the spend across the complete range of assets that we need to maintain within this programme. 
uh, and uh, it does require uh, movement over time on some of the spend. Uh, in the past, there will have been additional money put into surface dressing, uh, and we'll be showing a decrease there uh, in, in the moving into the next year. Um, but it's, it's for members to agree uh, which uh, programmes get at which levels of funding, but realising that the, the bottom line is, is the figure that has been agreed by uh, full council in the budget setting process. Right, Sean. I just love I know uh, Doug's been out in space for a wee while, but I think he was down to earth uh, when the budget was, was submitted. And um, I think the, the Conservatives had the chance to actually put forward a budget if they'd wanted more into the roads, but they failed to do so. So it's no good complaining about it now. OK, um, we're, we're not going to go there, Willie. Why no? <laughs> A couple of points to make, Chair. Uh, first point is 3.18 on page 37. Uh, this refers to the Dymill Kilstay Coastal Protection. And I was extremely disappointed to hear at uh, Kirkmaiden Community Council an email uh, under the name of Councillor Ross Surtees being read out, where uh, an, uh, she, asked, she requested uh, a presence of a council official to explain what was happening with, with the Kilstay, the Dymill Kilstay coastal protection, but was told that uh, she, uh, she could not get that. And that was disappointing, given what I'm reading here. All parties agreed that community buy-in to uh, any emerging proposals is vital and accordingly appropriate engagement will need to be progressed. I would hope that, that officials are here as public servants and that when requested, they will attend uh, community council meetings to explain. This is a serious issue, as the first point makes. There was fatalities, two, tra a tragic incident where two people lost their lives. Uh, and I would hope that uh, this committee will ensure that when a request is made, that uh, an official attends uh, to uh, the business by attending the community council meeting, the cup maiden in this instance. Uh, that, that's my first point. On the same point, uh, I refer to the Dye Mill Corner, and I've been in communication with officials and uh, I've had a reply. I do believe this particular corner, with the way that the road uh, is cracking up, that it re may require an engineering, an engineer's report to see whether indeed uh, there is any subsidence on the bank before there is any fatality. And already two community councils in the area have raised this with me. And I would hope that we can get back to this committee an engineer's report as to whether the bank is subsiding and if there is, the people are in any danger in terms of road safety. Uh, I have corresponded uh, and I'm sure I can pick that up with uh, Graham there. My next point, again, is in 3.11 chair on page 36. Uh, and I note the car parks that have been done or, or, or to be done. But this is one that has been done. Uh, and with a good grace of uh, Graham and his team, we actually got the car park in Agni Park in Stranraer uh, surfaced. But that was following a project uh, on the waterfront where there was no account taken with regards to the revenue costs of the project. The capital work was done, then there was no money to actually surface. And what we're finding now is that it maybe was a job on the cheap, but the whole place is flooding to the extent that people uh, are finding that they can't use part of the car park. So I would hope that we can return to that and find some way of putting in some drainage into the Agnew Park car park. There are other issues that Graeme knows about, and I'll raise that with him in person. My last point is to Stranraer Harbour Health and Safety Works. And without going there in terms of the barrier, because the, 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 as I understand it, there is a complaint that has been raised uh, uh, on procedural matters uh, that has been outstanding since December for a reply. Uh, uh, and the individual is still waiting on uh, a reply to the complaint, but it's the sentence here. A further public engagement on the developing proposals uh, with the community is planned for April and May, 
Well, I hope if the engagement is in it, that it'll be a lot better than the previous engagement where the overwhelming people of Stranra did not want the barrier and they may not want the proposals that are being suggested, that this is an engagement that has meaning and it's meaningful in terms of the consultation. If the people are saying that it's not necessary, we take cognizance of that and the people's voices in Stranra is heard. Uh, I'll let the director answer the first point, Willie, but on the last point, obviously consultation is really important to with local people. However, there are some times when the consultation, when people think they know better than some experts in the, in the area, but I'm going to let officers deal with that side. So, so Alison, you deal with the first one. Okay, uh, on, on the first one, Councillor Scobie, I'm going to make it quite clear to you uh, that uh, the whole issue about speaking to the community or the community council with regard to what happened in the Drum Drumore area is not appropriate this time for officers. There is a, a, a police inquiry ongoing, and I, I have taken advice from uh, uh, Rona Lewis, and she agreed with me that it was not appropriate to be speaking on these matters at the moment. Now, we'll speak offline on that, and that's my view, and I, I emailed Councillor Surtees with that view. Uh, there's no doubt there'll be a fatal accident inquiry associated with that tragedy and recommendations will no doubt be made as a result of that. And we will have to take cognizance of these recommendations in anything we do going forward. So absolutely we want to speak to communities and we're always here to serve members and serve community councils, serve the public. But there are some circumstances where it's not appropriate. And that is my strong view. Now I know that uh, Rona Lewis is re-looking at this issue and if we can help the community in any way, then we will. And I can give you that assurance. On the health and safety issues that you mentioned, this very committee took uh, expert advice on the proposals for the harbour from a health and safety expert. You weren't a member of the committee at that time. Many of the members will agree with, with your sentiment, but members had to accept that advice because we were inspected by the Health and Safety Executive and had the possibilities of, of, of being, being uh, penalised uh, for, for the areas uh, that were being operated. So we have to take cognizance of that as well. And sometimes the solutions that we put in place aren't popular, but we have to protect the Council from its health and safety duties. And, and that's all I want to say about it. And on the other two points, uh, Graham or Stephen? The Dymo uh, Road, I will chase up with the team leader you've been in touch with on that, get the details, and we'll take a view whether we need to have a review by our, our engineer and design colleagues on that. You want to come back in? That's a car park at Agnew uh, Park, and I'm sure, Graham, you know, we need some drainage in there. Could I come back on uh, this, you know, the, the information that the Community Council sought and still are seeking has to do with the development of the road and as is laid out in 3.18, that's the very information that the, the community council wanted, not to interfere with the inquiry or, or, or the fatal incident. Uh, uh, and recognising there will be, uh, I would imagine, a fatal uh, incident inquiry, that's not what the community council were asking. They were asking to get detail or uh, assurances in terms of how the road at that particular uh, location was going to be developed. So I see no reason why the, di the director or indeed any of his officers cannot go out and speak to the community council on the proposals in terms of the road. And it's all laid out there because they want to talk about the, the alternative, the diversional route or the B7065 when marks do start because in their opinion it is not uh, fit for purpose. And I know it's being suggested in here there will be passing places but again, the community want to be able to speak to officers who are the experts on it. And uh, I would see that it is as public servants, then they would be obliged to do that, notwithstanding uh, any inquiry on the fatal incident. And I would hope that, that this committee w would uh, affirm that view. Uh, on the health and safety issue, I said I, I was not going to speak at it. Cognizance could have been taken in other ways in terms of how uh, safety, health and safety could have been addressed. 
not necessarily with a barrier, and health and safety never ever no, saw a well, barrier was necessary. Can I just stop you responding can, to can I just the stop director, you? Chair? I'll, I'll just, and, and, and the director responded to you about the health and safety issue, about the decision was taken here at E and I committee. There was no other, uh, there was no other um, changes to that that decision that came forward to E and I committee. So the decision that was taken was, was is a stance. Um, the director's already said about the, 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 the and, and it wasn't going to carry on with any any um, discussion with you about the 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 the, 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 the fatal incident inquiry that's actually going on at the moment. Now, we'd be very careful what we need to say here, because obviously that whatever we say and, and make the decisions on, um, it may be that the fatal inquiry will, will, will understand why we made those decisions. All right? So, do you want to? Yeah, just in answer to Councillor Scobie, I, I, I've, I've said my piece and I'm, I'm saying no more. I've said to you that Rona Lewis is looking at how we might be able to address the community and we'll see if that's possible. The yeah. last time we reported on this, we, we, it was on our, our, our capital report back in November. Uh, the BBC picked up uh, that report. Uh, the Principal Procurator Fiscal picked up that information on the BBC website and the police wrote to us following that. So we have to be extremely careful in what we're saying about this because of the circumstances. OK, we're going off track with this actual report here at the moment. So therefore, Stephen, I'm going to take you in. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, so it was actually uh, following up a little bit on the inspection record uh, question that came up earlier. So page 117, it does talk about the works order management system and total repair. And I think we were trying to see if there was a way that uh, elected members could access uh, inspection information because it's of use to the community when somebody's reported uh, road defects, etc. Just so we know, yes, action's been taken, it's been inspected, we've got the details, etc. Um, but there is a... It's how this ties in with our repair records, if you like. So um, uh, on, a, on a rural road, which is maybe the, the lowest category, which maybe now will only get inspected once annually, there may be defects arise that, as the result of a repair, um, that unless it's reported and then repaired, uh, or, or it's recorded properly at the time as being a sufficient repair, it's going to be a year until that um, piece of road is going to be inspected again, during which time the local community, and it might be a small rural community, is um, feeling the effects of that damage to the road uh, and feeling that the, it's going to be a year before it gets looked at again. Now, is, is there a way we can tie on to the inspection records, um, the resulting repair records, if you like, so that we have a, an assurance that, at the point at which a repair is taken, we know that we can say it's done to that quality, it's done to that uh, level of standard that we as a council would expect from our contractors or our own staff, um, so that the local communities can uh, take that assurance, at least we know we've tried our best to do the best possible service. Thank you. Yeah, part of the process is that the inspector will obviously take a photograph of the defect as they see it at the time it's passed for repair, and then when it is finally repaired, there's a further record taken of the repair. So that can be monitored in the office, and um, I haven't given a lot of thought, but there could be a random sample taken off the repairs as well. We can look into some, doing something like that by inspectors to make sure there is, there isn't just left, they aren't all just left for one year before anybody goes back to them. So we can look at incorporating something like that into it as well. But there is a record taken off the repair. And, and, and with the, the idea of, of members getting a chance of seeing that, that, that report so they can report back to their community. Sorry, as I said earlier, we'll look at that, uh, look at how we can provide reports to members, yeah. Okay, um, we have David James. Good morning, Chair. Can I start by congratulating the Director that despite the cuts meted out with the SNP government, he has maintained output an incredible amount. Um, there's been a comment this morning about um, the fact that the Conservatives did not produce a budget, and that, those comments are getting boring. We're hearing them all the time, so it needs to be put to put to bed. A uh, Conservative Party is one of efficiency and not waste. It would be a waste of our time in the party. Uh, the waste of council advised, this is not relevant, David. Well, we just can you, you let, you let the comment the, come from here. Can you stick to no, the No, not at all, because we're going to hear that all year for a year. Let's David, just put it to bed today. David. So we know that there was no interest in our budget because there weren't 22 people that would even support a consensus budget. So we can finish it there. I will not mention it again if no one else does for the rest of the year. Continuing 
Integrated Land Remediation, 3.35. I would just like clarity here. It says at the end, the Friesen Gallery Council have a legal duty as a regulatory authority to inspect, identify, and remediate contaminated land. May I ask, is that land that is in our ownership, or do we have to remediate all contaminated land or enforce compliance? Stephen? The, the, the Council doesn't have an obligation to remediate all contaminated land. Sorry, can you clarify that again, what you just said there? The, so the Council doesn't have an obligation to remediate all contaminated land? Does not. There is some occasions where it has an obligation to remediate contaminated land. Okay, are we happy with the wording here then? Yes. Okay. Um, Sean, you were doing, but you, you wanted to come in on the same point earlier on. Have you still got another question? No. Rose. Um, I think my point's been clarified, Archie. It was regarding um, the issue Councillor Scobie brought up and the fact that Rona Lewis is urgently looking to see how we can um, meet the community. Okay, thank you. Tommy. There you go. It's just really a side issue on what Wally Scobie was talking about. It's not the issues. It's merely, I think, there's a bigger issue, maybe not for this committee, but for full council. And it's how officers respond to elected members. We are told, we as councillors, we are the council. The officers are there to respond to our needs. I'm more and more finding that sort of happening. And I think there should be an inquiry into that. I'm looking at the delegations of this particular committee and I don't think it is for this committee it will be for standards if, if that's required um, so I'll, I'll, I will ask the director to consider that and, and see where it goes forward okay um, Ian Thanks Chair, I'm not going to mention the fact that we did ask to propose to put £2 million extra into the roads, I'll leave that there because nobody else has got to mention it that was within the leadership, of course, of the two groups. Sean was not didn't he actually hear that, was not part of that discussion. But see, when it comes to a couple of points that we picked up, I know uh, Doug was talking kind of tongue-in-cheek, but we do get like a condition uh, survey or our assets. We get that uh, on occasion. I just wonder, can we see that at some point? When will we see it? And what's the course against that into bringing it up to our, con our assets across the Bruce and Galloway? So we're responsible for that. Is it our fit for purpose? And again, going back to the kind of safer routes for schools, we're talking about that particular appendix in the schools that haven't been done. Can we see a report coming back for that as well, Chairman, as we move forward? There was one other thing, unless I've missed it in an email, I did speak to the Director about it, but I asked for some information at the last committee. Couldn't raise it under uh, matters arising, but the same subject, subject matters here. Don't think I've received that yet. It was in relation to uh, procurement details and, and costings, so unless I've missed the email, it wouldn't be the first time I've missed an email, so it could well be that's the case, but Maybe if that's forthcoming at some point, if, I've, if, if I haven't got it, that is. So the two things is, are we going to see the conditions of our assets? Are we going to see a report on that and how much that'll cost to bring them up? And I'm thinking the amount of money we're spending on them. Is it enough? So we need to really face up to it if we're going to see a detriment or not and the safer routes to school thing, Chairman. Really? Thank you. On the first point, we last took uh, brought a status report to this um, regarding the roads asset to this committee last November, um, and that was the status of the roads asset going from the National um, Scottish Road Maintenance Condition Survey that's under undertaken annually in the summer. We will be taking bringing that report again to this committee again this November based on the same the same information received. That's excellent. I think within that report, it said that we were about a £193 million backlog from memory. Now, if that's the case, I wonder if we could see how much, even to bring it up to, uh, so it's no event of detriment, it's going forward. Now, that was a kind of different, kind of, it went against the trend, that, that report from memory, but I'd just be keen to see if this coming year, if that's the case, and how much do we actually need to spend on an infrastructure to keep it fit for purpose, would be good to see that in that report if it's coming back in November. I think that would be in the report anyway, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're looking to do some further statistical analysis on the data um, from what the data that we've had previously and sort of going back to the report we brought to this committee in November 14, uh, we're looking to sort of revamp that and sort of the prioritisation of the spend, where we're spending money if we're getting the right spend in the right places. Okay, thank you. And Director, that um, email. Uh, apologies, Councillor Crowley, that you haven't got that yet, but that, I'll chase that up following the meeting. 
Thank you. Um, Chair, again back to 3.35. Um, I don't see it in the recommendations. Are we being asked to note this or um, do anything with 3.35? I'm just uncomfortable with the wording. The members that are under the recommendations will be, uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be covered in that, that set up there because it's actually part of the report. Um, when you look at the contaminated land remediation, there is a report coming back to this committee at a future date for the all, all contaminated land across um, Dumfries and Galladay that we have responsibility for. We do have, again, an exempt report later on, but if you just flagged up a specific issue, um, but I think there is a, a further report, contaminated land report, coming to this, this committee uh, in, in, in the near future. So it will be within the, those, those parameters of that report that you can make suggestions. But so we're just reading that today. We're not noting it or even uh, agreeing to it. Sorry. Well, if you look at the recommendation we're, uh, at 2.1, we're approving the proposed programme budgets. We're approving the proposed list of infrastructure class asset capital programme projects. We're noting the current proposal in relation to off-site uh, I'm hopefully going to agree to the proposals in relation to off-site infrastructure and 2.5 agree the implementation of the new policy. Well, that's it. So it's, it's basically a part of the report. It's in within the body of the report, but uh, the recommendations that will come for the contaminated land will come at a later, later report. Okay, and, and on, sorry, Stephen. It's the same point, Chair. Um, I mean, I, I can see that Councillor James might be picking up on the... Uh, where it says, the Increasing Gallery Council have a legal duty as regulatory authority to inspect, identify and remediate. So it suggests that um, I, 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 I would think that that is probably like, well, if we've inspected and identified, do we remediate or do we ensure that the appropriate person remediates the kind of idea that the polluter pays sort of thing? Because it does read as if, yeah, once we've done that, we have to do it. You know, so I'm just wondering, is there something semantically we can say that we oversee the remediation of the land or something like that? You know, that, that maybe, is that, I don't know if that's what you're getting. Yeah, yeah. Stephen, you want to come up? Yeah, we can we can clarify that in the future when we, we use that text that uh, there are some occasions where we are responsible to remediate land and some occasions where we need to oversee the remediation and and look at the the, 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 the enforcement to a certain extent of that. Well, yeah, chair, it's just to get an assurance. I didn't get the answer on the car park and Agnew uh, Agnew Park car park. It's just to get an assurance that uh, Graham and I will look at that in terms of drainage. He's, he's given that assurance, nodding his head. Okay. We we'll move to the recommendation as members. Uh, we're asked to approve 2.1, approve 2.2, note 2.3, agree 2.4, and agree 2.5. Ian? Would it be possible, Chair, of the 2.6, just to add that further report in regards to low cost measures around about the uh, safer routes to school stuff? Just so we see a report coming back, that's all at some point in the future. We can make it an action, Ian, so that we can get into the, the um, diary of, you know, yeah. We now go on to um, the largest report, mainly because of the, the size of the um, thing. And this report seeks approval for the National Roads Development Guide and it used for guidance in the design of new developments within Dumfries and Galloway. The report also asked members to approve local variations to the guide, and the Head of Infrastructure and Transportation will take any questions on the report unless you've got anything to add to it, Director. Uh, nothing to add at this stage, Chair, thank you. Okay, members, questions? Stephen? Yeah, so uh, no, I, think, I think this probably is a common sense way forward to adopt the guidance. Um, it was just actually to do with the local variation, so there's two appendices there on page 343 and uh, 345. The first one, I, from what I'm reading, I think it, it basically outlines where we currently vary, I think. And then Appendix 3 is where we would now, having adopted and made consistent all the previous variations, this is where we would actually va choose to vary it locally. So, and I think it was just really, when it's expressed in the text, I wasn't clear that Appendix 2 is basically, uh, basically that's historical, and the Appendix 3 is what we will do from now on. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm over to you. Correct. Andrew, then, welcome. 
Thanks, Chair. I probably agree with um, Stephen. It, it, it's probably wise to adopt this policy. My question is, well, it's not a question, it's more of an, an observation. On page 319 in the, in the table, it refers to the cartilage of a house. I don't believe houses have cartilage. I imagine that's cartilage, if that could be cascaded back up to the writer of the report. Yep. I'm sorry, I was looking at the uh, the text at the, m at the time. Could you repeat the question, please? Sorry, it's page 319, and it's in the table um, under cycle minimum, and it refers to what it, what should be the cartilage of the house as the cartilage of the house. I don't believe that's any bone structure in a home. I, th I think you're well, absolutely right. We'll feed that back in the next group meeting. <laughs> uh, uh, you're absolutely right there, Andrew. May Malcolm. Thank you, Chair. It's just a small point on page 345, uh, 3.1.8, street planting considerations. Uh, and Dumfries were inundated with issues at the minute regarding trees. Uh, would this come into effect straight away? And if so, would that speed up potentially the replanting of uh, trees in the high street? Graham? I think the planting of the trees in the high street is an issue for my colleagues in communities. Um, we did have a discussion with them yesterday about how we approach containment for trees. And we were going to have a further discussion on it as well. But I don't think from what I remember he said yesterday, we're perhaps a bit too late in the season for planting trees, but I'm no expert. Okay. Mal Malcolm? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I just uh, one of my previous one of my previous jobs with uh, was with uh, British Gas, and I'm well aware of the issues of trees and roots and infrastructure under the surface. And I think I think going forward, from a practical point of view, I think a you know, root containment things are a good idea. Okay. Sorry, members, we are asked to agree the adoption. Uh, 2.1 and 2.2, we are asked to agree that. Happy with that? Thank you. Right, now, as we come on to item 8, which is disposal of land at Brooms Road, Car Park, Dumfries. This report seeks agreement to declare that 25 square metres of land at Brooms Road, Car Park, Dumfries is surplus to requirements for the Economy, Environment, Infrastructure Service, as required by the Council of Disposal Acquisition Policy. Um, this is where the old toilet used to sit as you went into Brooms Road. Um, the one that costs £14 for a pee, if I remember right. Um, rather, rather is the £20 that you put in the door. Um, and, and this is to put a substation on for the electrical charging points for, for vehicles uh, within that particular area. Uh, have you got anything to add to that, Director? Nothing to add to the report at this stage, Chair. Thank you. Members, Malcolm. Uh, it's actually just the, the way 3.1 reads about the, the council fleet services are installed. I mean, I'm assuming these charging points are for, for every, everyone to use and it's not just for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, for the public to use, yes. Stephen and then John. Yeah, it was just, I was just seeking a little bit of clarity around uh, the disposal process. So um, in 3.4, and, I mean, in terms of what we're trying to achieve with this report, I can, I can, I can see how it can be fully supported. But I think with 3.4, the last uh, report we had back to PNR in terms of our acquisition and disposal process, um, it didn't maybe set out this process as clearly maybe as it's been alluded to here. So I was just wondering if there's any comment on um, is that something that members would have had full sight of? Because we did review the, the acquisition disposal process in light of the Community Empowerment Act, etc., and uh, to do with common good properties, etc. So. What happens after this, and um, once we determine this, um, does does that then go on a list with Strategic Asset Board and circulate in the usual ways, or is this a special case? So this is it's not being treated as a special case. It's, it's running through the process uh, that uh, officers apply for the disposal uh, of assets. What, what was agreed at Policy and Resources Committee was, was the first stage of the process, and that you've uh, referred to is that 
council-owned properties identified by the service department as being no longer required for operational purposes. And that's really the stage that we're at. There's been a, just explanation given to officers that to, to, to make sure this is a robust approach, that that should also be done through the service committee. Uh, so that the department as a whole, including the service committee, is taking a view uh, that the land is surplus. So rather than just officers making that decision, there is the opportunity here for a, a more robust approach. Uh, and that's that's the purpose of the, the, the report today, is just to flag that with the service committee. It then follows through uh, for a report to the, the council strategic asset board, which is the, the officer group that looks over the whole council at the capital investment and the capital uh, acquisition and disposal issues. Uh, I then understand that it will go to uh, area committee uh, for consideration of the most appropriate organisations to consult with. Um, probably uh, quite a lot of work for quite a small piece of land in this case, but for larger parcels of land where there might be other interests in the community, uh, quite a rigorous process. Um, so we are, we are following the process for the disposal uh, as agreed by policy and resources with that kind of uh, added kind of clarity that uh, when we're getting the service department to consider it surplus, we're actually asking the service committee to review that at the same time. Welcome back. Just a quick one. Yeah, no, that's helpful to, to hear that. I think I think in terms of, it's maybe something that we should maybe feedback that that's updated so it's explicit in our uh, disposal and acquisitions because I, I do, I think there is merit in actually having it uh, come to the service committee for that um, robustness of process anyway. But I think it's maybe something we need to be more robust about in our published policy because it, it may be something that's still to be um, brought back to committee for that amendment. I don't know if it would be this committee, maybe policy and resources, but we'll, we'll have a dis discussion on that and see where it's best fitted, okay? And I, yeah. I, I can raise that as an issue at the Strategic Asset Board who, who oversee the kind of policy. Um, Vice, you want to come on? Chair. Uh, with regard to us being the owner, does that mean we have to decontaminate the land before we transfer it? We are, um, it, it's, it's a minimal excavation, isn't it? Yes. And we're actually sealing uh, the surface, so I, I wouldn't consider it to be treated dissimilar to the existing car park, which is effectively capping a site that has a known historical problem with contamination because of the, the previous uses. Um, so we're taking part of the green verge in the car park and actually we'll be capping it uh, to then uh, develop the foundation to mount the, the Scottish power, the, 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 the power equipment on. John Young. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm very pleased that we're going to have additional charging points at Broom's Road Car Park. The point I want to make is at the moment an a, a electric vehicle driver coming to that car park would actually find it quite difficult, particularly when it's busy like it is this morning with lorries and caravans, to actually locate who the chargers are. Uh, could, could I ask that if you go to the likes of the yes, city of Dundee, they make a big feature of their car charging points, and I wonder if we could do similar here, perhaps have solar way above head panels south-facing to collect the electricity while they feed the chargers. Yeah. Um, in terms of Brim's Road car park, they will be much more visible because they will be directly at the bottom of the ramp as you come off Shakespeare Street to the left and to the right there. Um, so they will be much more visible. And I appreciate I have, well, there were some discussions with the fleet manager some time ago about, about signage to all vehicle charging points, and that's something that's to be progressed in the future. Yeah. John? No, I quite welcome the extra charging points going in, because uh, I know at present, like, the, the points that are there are connected into the day centre, and I think uh, the bills were going steadily up, but I think we have reimbursed them. Can we just make sure that they get any other reimbursements that they're due? It's connected into the day centre, the supply for the electric charging points just now. No. We'll feed that back to the fleet manager, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. What is the dis distinction between a rapid charger and a fast charger? Well, I think, Jim, you need to go to one of these APSI seminars and they would tell you all about it. But I'll let the officer answer that one. Like, rapid chargers can be done within 30 minutes and a fast charger can be done within an hour. So basically, if you stop at a motorway station, for instance, a rapid charger will give you a, a sudden boost 
to the battery that's in your your car, so you can go for a cup of coffee, come back, it should be charged to at least eighty percent. Um, the, the 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 fast chargers, if you're stopping off for an hour, two hours, something like that. But it's certainly not an overnight job, if you know what I mean. Okay. Um, Ian. A small point here, just because it's in, I find it interesting the contaminated land thing. So I just wonder, would it be a possibility for the council to satisfy its statutory obligations? So if it was passing on a piece of land or selling it, be a condition of sale or, or passing on. So the decontamination of that land would then land on the responsibility of the, the new owner, so to speak. I would have thought that would be the, the natural route to take, especially when it's small amounts of contamination. Would that be a possibility, I would have thought? And maybe it'll get covered in policy and resources committee on Thursday, I'm not sure. Stephen? We'll speak with the council's contaminated land officer and make sure that appropriate uh, checks are undertaken in terms of any obligations in the future with the transfer of the title. Okay, thank you, members. We'll go to the recommendations in. Uh, we're happy to agree that the 25 square metres land indicate the showing of appendix one is surplus to requirements. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to item number nine, which is local development plan supplementary guidance and planning guidance update. This report sets out the position with regards to supplementary guidance and non-statutory planning guidance and provides an update on the various pieces of guidance that will support the Council's second local development plan when it is adopted later in the year. The Head of Plan and Regulatory Service will take any questions on the report unless you've got anything to add to it, Director. Nothing to add at this stage, Chair. Thank you. Okay, members' questions? Well, the, the only question is, I suppose, and maybe a proposal, Chairman, see what, see what the committee is thinking. Uh, it shows that these all came through in January 18. Was that actually the case? If they all came through at that point, I actually missed them. I don't know why that. I must have been sleeping that day. I know the committee, but it shows they've all come through. It's just a point of process. But I think when it comes to the decision making, the obvious bit for me as a starter for 10 would be uh, under recommendation 2.2 .2 is the four items in 3.8 would have been four good items to start off with, but actually we shouldn't have let any just slip through the net without having some kind of seminar workshop on them, but I thought the four identified in 3.8 would have been a good start for 10 to look at them first. And I think that, that's why 2.3 is to get your suggestions as to go forward, and thanks for that, Ian, on the 3.8, I agree with that. Uh, Sean? Yeah, I think the only one that would probably merit um, uh, <coughs> discussion at a seminar is also um, developers' contributions. That might be house and development. You know, that might be quite, quite useful for members as well. Yeah, um, I remember we did about five or six seminars at the last time we did this, but it was never off a big turn up for members at these seminars. So I don't want to be putting seminars in place where members are not going to turn up. I think I think the opportunity for turning up is right, but we want to make sure that members are there as well. And 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 I would agree that that the developers' contribution possibly for people for members understanding. What that actually means would be a good one to add to that particular thing. David? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, towards the end of the LDP2 um, site allocation, we had the sort of fairly formal, sort of semi forced um, seminars, uh, which were quite good because they encouraged all the councillors to take part, and there was a uh, there's a lot of local knowledge within the council body, so I think that's a better way of doing it rather than just hoping that people will engage with the process. Um, like Ian, I must have been I must have been sleeping. I spoke to um, Steve a few times um, earlier on in the, in the process, and um, I thought first of all he'd said that that our engagement with supplementary guidance would take place um, almost a year ago, um, but the time schedule seems to move to the right. But I didn't realise that had been out for um, representations. Um, so I, I don't want to sleepwalk through this. And I'd like to know, um, is are these seminars, uh, are, they, are they more in the way of workshops? Can we really feed into and affect uh, the policy? Or is policy going to be really formed before we get to these the, the last moment? OK. Steve. <clears throat> Yes, um, thank you, Chair. If I could um, respond to that and, and also um, one or two other um, comments that have been made. The, the, the draft supplementary guidance that is associated with LDP2 was all published at the same time as the proposed plan so that everybody could read not only the policy that was being proposed in the plan, but also how it was to be supported by the supplementary guidance. And that was an improvement that we made following feedback from the previous version of the local development plan where we published supplementary guidance 
some time after the policy had already been set. So that, that was the reason for the change, and that, and that was why we published all, um, did you say it was, eight, I think it was 18 um, pieces of su draft supplementary guidance. What needs to happen with those next is that they need to be brought back to this committee to be confirmed uh, and agreed before they are then forwarded to Scottish Government uh, for final uh, sign-off. So there is an opportunity between, between now <coughs> and bringing the um, supplementary guidance back for members to become engaged again in the detail of what is contained within that supplementary guidance. And in response to, um, I think, some queries and questions that were raised when we brought the report in November, um, which was outlining the future timetable for LDP2, in response to the discussion at that point, we said we would bring back some proposals for engaging members in the development of the detail of those supplementary guidance before it comes back for a formal sign-off from the committee. So we can arrange those seminars or a seminar um, depending on feedback from members uh, any time between, <coughs> really between the um, receipt of the uh, examination report into the LDP, um, because we don't yet know if any of the policies are going to be changed for us by the reporter. And so when we receive that report, we'll know that we can proceed with all the supplementary guidance as we had intended. So over the summer, we would hope to arrange all those, um, however, uh, many seminars are, are, are needed. In terms of the suggestions, um, paragraph 3.8 is really just a list of, uh, of customer guidance documents. So whilst there are one or two issues that are listed there, um, principally um, housing in the countryside, uh, I would suggest that it's probably better to look at, um, at the appendix and uh, in particular to, to look at page um, 355, which, which lists the pieces of supplementary guidance which are currently in draft form, have been up for consultation, and could form any one of those, or any number of those, could form the basis for us having um, a seminar involving and engaging elected members before we bring it back to the full committee. And certainly housing in the countryside is one that has been flagged up um, previously, so I would anticipate that that would be one that you'd want to have a, a good look at and a good discussion about, but there may well be others on that list. Okay, Rose. Thank you, Chair. Um, what concerns me about the seminars is uh, the assumption that they are always in Dumfries. And what concerns me about that is that I think we have the capability of, of uh, being inclusive in this council, there are a number of councillors across the region who really want to come to the seminars and find them fascinating and helpful. But I feel at a disadvantage. I spent 12 hours in my car last week. That is 12 hours that I am not able to do emails work. And I have been told informally, and I won't, certainly nobody in this room presently, that officers are very busy. But if I can work remotely and I can use my equipment, to keep in touch with my work, then surely, surely the officers can do that too. And I please appeal to this committee to consider using technology and include, um, you know, councillors from across the region. So the opportunity to use Skype and things like that would be a possibility for members in other, uh, and certainly in the, in the west of the region. Um, um, just on Skype, Skype's great, and we are certainly beginning to use that a lot more. But a small little, you know, screen in the corner doesn't do it. So, you know, we've given up, I think, a few of us every now and then when we've tried to Skype into these sessions. So with this fantastic equipment, surely we can use it on a, a bigger screen. Steve, do you take that in consideration when we come to the seminars and things like that? Yeah, we'll certainly feed that back to uh, committee services as well, who, who set these things up for us. I, know, I do know they try to tie them in with other business that's going on so that you're not having to make special journeys just to come to the seminar. But I'll certainly give that feedback to them. Okay, Ian. Uh, and I, by the time Steve had got to it, I think I'd, I'd kind of realised that I'd, the mistake that I'd make in regards to 3.8. So just looking down at the comments that I made, I thought developers' contributions, as Sean's already 
spoken about, I think, but housing development in the villages, housing in the countryside, conversion, traditional, traditional agricultural stairs and affordable housing also as well. Had a lot of comments in regards to affordable housing. That's maybe too many for one, but I think certainly the ones that are of high interest to myself and the wider public uh, when I speak to them. Okay, did you get that? Yeah, and certainly I think there's common common threads that run through all of those chairs. So um, we, we we could try to cover those in a in a single seminar if possible to to make best use of everybody's time. John Young then more. Yeah, thank you, Jane. I wonder if it would be possible to have a review of the our present guidelines in replacing windows, particularly in conservation areas, as a seminar. Steve. Chair, yes, um, certainly that, that is a, an issue that can be addressed. I think we've, we've addressed it directly as well in the covering report in response to a, a number of approaches that we've had. So, yes, we, we, we would certainly include that one. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was just actually going to raise the same point as Joan there, uh, 3.12. This is a, a big issue in uh, the Dumfries conservation area, what people are allowed to do. And I think providing some clarity on the the windows would be well worthwhile. And also to back up Rose, I know Rose has got um, a, a lot further to travel than me. I mean, I'm, I'm a local member, but I find sometimes with seminars and things, the big issue for me is timing and things. And again, if I could even access it remotely, it would make make it a lot easier for me because I would really like to be to more involved in it. Okay, thank you. Andrew? Thank you, Chair. My question is on the same page, number 355. It's regarding the Shenar, uh, the Shenar Conservation Area Appraisal and Management Plan. It says that it was adopted last month. We didn't have a committee last It's saying that it was adopted February 2019. We didn't have a committee last month, but it's, it does say in the, at the end there, see September 18 EI committee report. Was that when we agreed to adopt? That's right. Steve. Yes, that's correct. It has to then go through a procedure with Scottish Government. So following the committee's sign-off to it, it then has to go away um, to Scottish Ministers um, to check that it complies with Scottish planning policy before we're actually formally allowed to adopt it. So that's the process that's uh, just been completed. Okay, thank you. Members, go to the recommendations. We're asked to note 2.1, and there has been some suggestions in 2.2 to take back, um, Stephen, and a, a, a list of... Um, either one or two seminars with, with those particularly and in, uh, in some dates for that with a view to looking at the equipment that we have for Skyping and things like that, okay? Members happy with that? Thank you. Okay. Item number 10, uh, members, is Local Development Plan Conservation Area Character, Character Appraisals and Management Plans, which may have brought an Andrew in here and uh, Lauren, we talked about the Strunwar one. Yeah. Um, the report provides a member with an overview of an outline work programme for the review of conservation areas across the region. It seeks approval for the adoption of the Dumfries Conservation Area Character Appraisal and Management Plan, which is CACAMP, and seeks agreement for, for the Moffat CACAMP consultation draft supplementary guidance to the local development plan to be published for six weeks public consultation. I have to say that Reading through this document, I think the, what, what Moffat did was actually some good practice, and I hope that other areas would take that on board to support um, our, our planning officers doing this this thing. Have you got anything to add to the report, Director? Nothing to add at this stage, Chair. Steve, Thank you. anything to add? Nothing to add just now, Chair. Members, Jim? Hi, just a kind of question, Chair. I'm, I'm happy with the report, and I, I would be encouraging communities to go down the car camp road to use the expression you use. But in 3.1, it sets out what the considerations or the purposes are. What onus does that place upon property owners? And I'm thinking, we, we tried, we've tried for years to get a derelict building strategy in place that's never yet <coughs> come to committee. And we have derelict buildings sitting in the middle of conservation areas that are completely destroying the, the character and, and appearance of these places. Does this a uh, car camp give us extra powers, or is it just simply an enhancement of the understanding of the historic significance or, or the communities? Steve, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair. It, 
it doesn't really give us extra powers. It gives us, I suppose, a, a stronger footing in terms of taking any um, statutory actions that we that we engage with uh, under the under the um, legislation as it currently stands. Um, it would also um, having in place um, things like uh, management plans also uh, underpins bids for external resources. So it makes it more likely that the council as a whole would be successful in terms of bidding for uh, regeneration funding and, and conservation funding, for example, from Scottish Government. No, no, I'm happy. I, I, just, I just wonder if there were extra powers and I understand that if, if there is a benefit and, and that's clear Moffat's leading the way, I'm sure others will follow, especially if there's an opportunity to draw in external funding to support the continuation and maintenance of these characters. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's just, it always seems to be a, a bit of a balance with the conservation area about keeping the character of the area and also bearing in mind the economic situation. And you get people sometimes give, get the impression that we would rather see a dilapidated building rather than one perhaps uh, enhanced a bit more sympathetically, but maybe not quite to the standards we expect here. But when you come back to the issue that you're on about powers, Again, people would like to see some consistent enforcement. There's a, a feeling out there that people can perhaps uh, do what they want and nothing nothing seems to happen. So if we are going to put enforcement in place, I would like, I would like to see that we make use of it. Steve, you want to come back on that? It's your area. <coughs> yeah, and, and certainly enforcement is, is an important issue. Um, and, and how we resource that enforcement is, a, is an important issue. Uh, we have in uh, recent times uh, had to adopt um, a much more um, prioritised and risk-based approach to uh, enforcement where we prioritise on the, on the kind of higher risk or higher impact cases that, that get brought to us. Um, but you're absolutely right to, to flag that up. Um, and it's important that um, if our conservation areas are going to be successfully managed. It does have to be underpinned by that enforcement regime. Uh, it's really just brought to light because there's a, a couple of issues locally within walking distance of this this building that have uh, caused a bit of upset. Perhaps you can maybe talk to Steve offline and, and see if something can be done about that. Okay, um, Jim. Well, I'll ask Stephen in first, Jim, before you. Yeah, it's fine. Just in the back here, I Malcolm got back. It's fine, Stephen. Okay. Uh, no, thanks. And yeah, it's, I'm very pleased to see the the, the Moffat um, CAC camp uh, in here because I know it's uh, something that the community has uh, had a, an input in in terms of trying to drive forward and work in partnership with the council officers. Um, because ultimately, we have to, as an authority, set the standard, I suppose, to which um, community led or, or, or externally led uh, proposals are going to have to meet. So I think we have to recognise our role in that regard that we can do everything. But we can set the standards to which other groups can meet, and then it's, it's up to us to then approve that. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see that here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no, then I'll go to the recommendations. And members are actually two people yeah. agree. Sorry, uh, Jim. I know. I'm just in a reassurance. I'm looking from from Steve, given the response he made. Complaints eight, raised with the plan department in relation to breaches of conservation area status, etc. Risk based. A, a, Interventions, I understand, but I presume every complaint will be a, a considered or looked at. We won't simply <coughs> decide if it's a mere modest complaint. We'll not look at it. If there's a complaint, we will address that. I mean, there is, there is a complaint. They, are, they are will address. They're effectively um, triaged, I suppose is the word, when, when they're first received, and then they're allocated a level of priority depending on the nature of them. But they are all dealt with. That's the question I was wanting to answer. That. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Jim. So we'll go to the recommendation. Member Ash Degree 2.1. That's to consider 2.2. Uh, uh, remit the powers of head planning to amend the conservation area character in 2.3. Uh, remit the powers to head plan and regulate to notify Scottish ministers of the Council's intention in 2.4. Agree to draft supplementary guidance, Moffat Conservation Area Character Appraisal in 2.5 and to receive a report back to this committee with the outcome of the public consultation at 2.6. Great, thank you very much. 
We'll now go on to item number 11, which is the Local Development Plan Draft, Non-Statutory Planning Guidance Development Brief for former Interfloor Factory Site Heath Old Dumfries. This report seeks approval for a development brief for the former Interfloor um, Factory Site Heath Old Dumfries. Um, it was asked for by local members, um, and, and there's been a bit of work done on this to, to move that forward. Director, you got anything to add to the report? Uh, nothing to add to the report, Chair. Thank you. Steve, anything? Nothing to add to the report, Chair. Yeah, thanks. Question, members? Do we agree the recommendation then? 2.1 and 2.2 authorise the head of planning authority to make minor changes. Sorry, sorry, Stephen. Well, I heard this with interest, but it was actually, um, it talks a lot about the history of the site, and it was actually, what do we know or what are we able to say about the current ownership of the site? Because it doesn't actually detail that in the report. Steve, do you want to come in at? Well, <clears throat> we, we do know that the, the site is currently um, on the market, it is up for sale. So um, the, um, the vendors are using a, a property agent um, who we've had uh, contact with. And the intention would be that once, um, subject to the, this being approved, that, that we would provide this um, to the agent uh, to help them with their with their marketing efforts to try to attract um, developer interest, so that, that that's how that um, issue would be addressed. Right. We've agreed two point one, so we're at, at two point two. Authorise the head of planning to make minor changes to form that appears technical details. Happy with that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Now we move on to item number 12, members. This is the Caravan Sites and Controller Development Act 1960 new license system for mobile home sites with permanent residents. Uh, this report provides members with an outline of the council's arrangement for a new licensing regime applicable to residential caravan sites and seeks approval for the setting of fees for the first time or renewal of a license. These regulations have been introduced to modernise the licensing regime where the enforcement provisions were outdated and there were few powers to deal with sites which failed to meet site licence conditions. I do know there have been some issues within the, 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 the mobile sites with regards to a fit and proper person being in place, for instance. Uh, and and this, this report, uh, I think, brings us into line with the rest of the, the, the UK. Um, so anything to add to the report, Director? Nothing to add to the report at this stage. Thank you. Steve? Steve. Nothing to add just now, Chair. Thanks. Members? Okay, there's no, no. Um, so therefore, members, we can go to the recommendations. We've been asked to adopt the Scottish Government model standards for yeah. additional home sites. Yeah. 2.2, the fee structure detailed in 3.16. 2.3, to a fit and proper person test for the caravan site license holders. And 2.4, to implement of this scheme with immediate effect. Can we agree that? Thank you very much. <coughs> Okay, now going to item number 13, which is the Dumfries Job Project. This report provides members with a progress report on the nest and egg removal project in Dumfries and asks for consideration of extension of the contract for the coming year. It also seeks approval to use alternative measures to reduce the number of adult adults. Um, some of the reason, of course, members, is that we've already agreed something in this, this, this uh, committee about waste, which is looking at seagull-protected waste bins in the Dufferish area, and we need the seagulls to actually be there to test them for, for one reason, which is why it's one of the reasons we're actually asking for the, uh, the, the extension for the year. If it wasn't for that, I, I, I personally would have been seeking to stop the seagull project for a year to see what you know the outcomes were actually of the last few years in this. But I do believe we have a, a, an opportunity here to check on some of the things that we're actually doing within the waste, um, waste contract. Director, have you got anything to add to the report? Nothing to add to the report, Chair. Thank you. Steve? <coughs> Nothing to add, Chair. Thanks. Hey, Willie? Yeah, Chair, now recognise uh, what we're doing in Dumfries. Uh, and I often wonder what's the difference between a Dumfries gull and a Stranar gull, because I've been Galloway Irish. Uh -huh. Right. I'm sure we'll soon have them talking to us anyway, because they're stealing the food out of the the Wainsies, uh, the, the school kids uh, at school. But, you know, I've been raising this with Steve and I've been raising it with the director for years in terms of Stranraer. 
Uh, and, you know, I, I wonder why, and I ask the question why uh, the budget just seems to have been set for Dumfries, notwithstanding that they have a particular problem there as well. But we have the, a similar problem in Stranraer, and indeed we have a word about event uh, within the next fortnight, not only in gulls, but now in pigeons, and we all know uh, the, the recent event with, with one of the hospitals in Glasgow uh, with the pigeons. So it's recognising that it's not just a complaint in Dumfries, that we have it in other areas, and how do we address this, notwithstanding again that it may not be the authorities, but we have precedence here in terms of approaching the, the problem in Dumfries, and we equally got to recognise other areas throughout the whole of Dumfries and Galloway here. I just want to know how we're going to do that. Steve? <coughs> Chair, I think the, um, the report explains the, the origins and the background as to, as to why this specific initiative developed in, uh, in Dumfries in response to some uh, quite specific and localised issues that were being created by um, an ever-expanding gull population uh, within the urban area in Dumfries. Um, I think also it's worth noting that the, the, the consultant's report, um, which is attached uh, to this item, at Appendix 2, does, does also uh, recognise and acknowledge that there, there may well be um, issues with gulls in other in other parts of the region. Um, there's specific reference uh, on the on the final page, page five four eight. There's specific reference to uh, to Annan. Um, so that's clearly a, a situation that's that's being uh, monitored um, and is on the radar of the of the consultants. At the moment, in terms of of Stramra, what we don't have is is any specific evidence as such, um, which is what this committee would require to be presented with, I think, if we were asking for any um, additional resources. However, what we can do is to ask the consultants that currently um, do this work for us uh, to have a look at the situation in Stramra and to, and to report back on us so that we have then a clear evidence base to bring back um, to this committee because I certainly am not in a position at this point in time to, to recommend anything uh, to members in, in the absence of, of that um, scientific evidence that the origin of the Dumfries project was a, was a kind of multi-agency partnership approach uh, which pulled in um, outside experts to initially assess and, and quantify the extent of the problem um, before any, um, any solutions uh, were, were developed. Um, and certainly that, that rigorous approach would be needed in order for us for example, to justify um, taking action under the under the general license conditions. Welcome back, Emily. Yeah, quickly, Chair. Uh, I appreciate what Steve's saying. I would take him up on his offer, uh, but you know, not in a censorious way. But uh, I ho would hope that the director uh, and the head of uh, environmental health do speak to each other, because at one time uh, the director did say that he would net. Uh, the Ryan Centre uh, and adjacent property, maybe the, the, the St Joseph's School has a particular problem in the West End at, at the, the flats, and I have raised this in the past, so I have been specific as to where the problems are. Uh, you know, and the gulls tend to nest in below where the the the, the Verto whatever the, the the heating systems that are put on the roofs. Uh, the panels. So I, I would hope that we can address the issue in Stranraer as we are doing in Dumfries and take Steve up on his offer and, and give the specifics uh, if that's acceptable to you. Yeah, I think we'll take one off uh, Steve's offer but directly when you come in. Uh, on, on the netting, uh, I, I didn't promise to do it personally, as you suggest, uh, but I, I, did, I did pass that on. I think it's important that uh, the council does set a good example, and uh, there are others that have passed that message too, that it should be addressed. Okay. Jim Dempster. Hey, thanks, Chair. I, I'm glad Willie raised the issue of other areas, because I think it's just the third year I, I've raised a, an area in my ward, and 
Honestly, it's like as if... I'm just, uh, just before he continues, I'm going to remind members this is a strategic issue, a strategic committee. Committed. We're getting, we're getting back into wards and wards and wards. Now, I keep on saying here at the start of them, I keep on saying at the start of this is about specific strategic issues here. If you've got issues with wards, then please contact the officers appropriately. I am not going to follow up with the data. I've got to go, I mean, we dealt with our new park uh, drainage and apparently that was acceptable a couple of issues ago. But anyway, I'm, I'm, being, advised, I'm being advised that we're going too parochial on this. I'm so going to, to stop it. I'm going to stop it. There are other areas in the region where members can identify and clear issue about gull infestation. And that has already been said by Steve, and he's willing to... So if, if the issue is, if you've got one, please talk to Steve I'll offline that's from great, the strategic... That, that's spot on, Chair. That's what I will do. Uh, Graham Nicholl. Thanks, Chair. Um, have we looked at other methods here? I mean, it was brought to my attention yesterday that there's a company in the Stewartry developing machines, or has developed a machine, to, to trap uh, starlings and on a commercial basis. So they use them at airports, I understand. And have we looked at approaching companies to develop something that could trap seagulls in a similar vein and take them away and dispose yeah. of them or whatever? I think this is a long-standing project anyway, but I, I don't know, Steve, if there's... there's or do well, I may be invite Greg to um, to respond to this in detail, but just to, to remind members that ev everything that, that we do has got to be within the terms of the general licence. Um, so that's attached for everybody's information at Appendix 1, starting on page 539. And if you look on page 541 and the bottom of page 540, it says um, it specifically identifies which methods are allowable under the license, under the general license issued by SNH. So as long as it falls within that remit, then it's okay for us to to use it as a responsible public body. But Greg, that was part of the goal task force were advised by Scottish government science and agricultural uh, advisors, uh, who are, uh, I'm absolutely sure, are, are experts in their field. Uh, in relation to these matters, uh, we've went through, you name it, any any amount of potential control measures which have been in the market, which have been trialled elsewhere, and they're collecting data, uh, that which they're coming back to me and saying what can be effective. Uh, what you're talking about there, that uh, some kind of trapping mechanism for, for starlings. We, we have, we've talked about, obviously, that's one of the recommendations here, that, that we can try and uh, carry out some trapping in Dumfries. But that would be carried out by by them on our behalf. We wouldn't be doing that ourselves, and it doesn't appear to be anything more specific than perhaps a large larson trap. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at that basically. Yeah, all right. As part as part of this, the, the use of alternative measures, we'll look at that and see what's available on the market. And if that can come under the license, then we'll look at it. Okay. It may even bring a bit of economy to the area. <laughs> um, Tommy. Yes, yeah, I'm not going to ask a question because I'd risk being parochial. But I assure by this by this time, the officers have now taken on board that this is a Dumfries and Galloway issue. Absolutely. Um, Sean, just thought if you if you asked if you asked Greg to open their door and then share it with the seagulls, then that would trap them. Um, but. I'm not going to be parochial because uh, oh, yeah. it mentions about Anne and Colony in here. So I just wanted to know that Greg spoke to Greg on a number of occasions and there has been ongoing issues there and there has been work done by Environmental Health to try and control the a little bit or in, con in conjunction with the pennies and, and others. Uh, but my question is, obviously it's on the radar, as you said, um, this area that we're talking about is potentially going to be an area that will see economic regeneration uh, shortly, hopefully. So I just wondered, what is the is the proposal that we continue with the Dumfries one, analyse the results of that, and then move on to, if, if it works, then move on to the likes of Dannon Colony and other colonies across the region? I, I, think, I think I'll come in here, actually, and, and, and just try and see a way forward. This report is about Dumfries 
and the Gulf Task Force, and that's all we have budget for. And in the past, that budget has been uh, been cut. I think it was cut by 30 or 40 thousand pounds. So we have minimal budget to address the Dumfries area and, and try and, and look at the solutions that may exist. We have a particular issue with Dumfries because it's a it's an ur urban gull issue. Many of our towns and many of the areas that have been mentioned are coastal, and, and it would be very unusual not to see a seagull in, in, in that particular environment. Now, Steve has offered to have uh, get the consultants to have a look at Stranraer to determine what the issues are, but that's as far as we can go. I don't think we can say that this is a Dumfries and Galloway regional issue that we're addressing. It's only Dumfries, and I want to make that absolutely clear so members don't have any expectations or hope that we'll be on our horses coming in to solve problems. When it comes to pigeons, there is nothing the council has a responsibility for uh, on, on pigeons. And if you're any, you've been to Venice, then it, you can see a real pigeon problem uh, there. And they're, they're very natural and they're very common in all our towns. All we can do is enforce and ask property owners where the roost to take action. And that's the point I now want to make. Property owners have a responsibility to, to, to deal with these issues. The council cannot be everything to everybody. And, and I would ask members just to understand that. Because the director just said, and, and it's absolutely right, when I look at Appendix 2, the report is on um, specifically for Dumfries. So then why does it mention a full paragraph on the Iron Colony? If, if, you know, if you're the, saying the, it's just Dumfries, why is that in there? Sean, I'll come, I'll come back on that. But that was actually the contractor's report rather than the council's. Why yeah, yeah. But uh, let's, 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 let's go on here. We've said it's a Dumfries school project. We're not going to get parochial. We've already been. The issue here is now that we've got uh, an input from David James. So that you should um, th Thank you. The, there's no doubt the, the goals are unpopular visitors to the town and uh, they're eating the, the stuffs that we, we leave lying around. Um, I see that you're able to use up to a semi-automatic uh, firearm to, to kill them. That sounds like good fun. And uh, maybe one day there'll be a sort of a hunter-killer drone that can completely eradicate them. But I mean, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, these are species that are actually in, in decline overall, although they're unwelcome in the towns. And um, shouldn't we be doing something, at least something nominal, to help them survive um, in the locations where we think they should be? Because we've um, got to bear in mind that bears wolves, lynx, they were all unpopular at one time and they are, they are actually no more at all. So um, I think there's a lot of talk about extending this to, to other towns, etc. But um, it would just be a, a time to look at the contra side of it, perhaps. Okay. Is there a question in that? No, because no one's interested. Okay. Okay, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think given that this is the Dumfries Gulf project, I can be slightly parochial. And uh, quite clearly, it is a big, a big concern for a lot of people. A lot of elderly people get terrified. I know, I know one lady's scared to go out in her garden because she gets dive bombed by seagulls. But it's actually the recommendation 2.2, .2, in particular, referring to paragraph 323. And the director's just said we've got a minimal budget. Much as I would love to see the seagull population in the priest drastically reduced, I think it would, it would help the town greatly. But when you use phrases like minimal budget and trapping, I then get concerned about the animal welfare issue of potentially seagulls being left trapped and uh, having a, a long and painful demise. So I would like a bit of reassurance that if we were going to pursue the trapping route, that it was going to be properly resourced and it was going to be suitable. I, th I think um, the director said earlier, anything that anything to do has to be done under licence and it's got to be done humanely. Um, and and, and any, time, any time that we get to that stage, we have to inform SNH and also get that licence backed up. So I, I can give you that assurance. I was really just as well on the back of the fact, you know, that we do, you know, budgetary constraints. will maybe play a part in that. We might not be able to afford as much trapping as we might have thought. 
I, th I think within the, the the extension of this is actually within the budget. We'd actually say it anyway, so there's, I don't think there's an issue with that. We're really looking at situations where it's a last resort. Where we don't have, you know, we're not going to whole scale cavalier attitude to trying to trap and reduce the number of, uh, you know, the total number of, of birds across North East and Galloway. We'll not be using these measures where it is, you know, in effect, we, we, we're, we can't achieve a resolution by any other means. That's the only place we would do that. John Martin. Thanks, Chair. It's someone that's been into this for the start, like, <laughs> as I say, we used to get, I used to get dozens and dozens of complaints. We used to get during the, during the nesting season, like, as I say, I think it's, a, as I say, I noticed this year the gull population has actually increased, but I dread to think it, what it would have been if we hadn't been removing the eggs. I know that it has been, it's very successful in my ward, being a wee bit parochial, considering it's Dumfries. But, uh, as I say, that has been a success. Like, I've not got, I, hardly, I don't think last year I've got any complaints. The last couple of years I've not had any complaints about the gulls. But you've just got to wonder how long you can let, you can keep going on at this. Like, as I say, I think it's a sensible way, as the chair said, to try these gull-proof bins, etc. And hopefully, but as I say, I dread to think about it would have been if I hadn't been removing the eggs and that. Like, but that has certainly been a successful part of it. <coughs> Thank you, John. Ian? Well, to be brief, but more, more kind of strategic. I think there's a strategic element to this, and I think maybe David James actually did ask a question. Uh, it maybe was worth an answer, but there is a, a cause and effect here as well. So if we do move them, we can manage to move them uh, in a, an environmental, uh, peaceful way, you could say, to where they sh maybe should be breeding and so on and so forth. That would be a good way to go forward, maybe kind of be done at this moment in time under the cost constraints. But when I was listening to different concerns that have been raised, uh, across the, uh, from quite a number of members, when I looked at Steve's already touching it, it's in the appendix, but it's also at 3.7, and it says the authorised people stroke operators in regards to the licence uh, terms and conditions. I thought the four points there are quite broad, that so gives quite quite a quite a big allowance. So when it comes to the extra trap and other than I think Malcolm's right, the, we have to make sure they're quite clear that's humane that, because there's a reduced cost level here, but. I think this should be, should and probably will be, my question is probably should and probably will be getting applied. So if there is, it has happened in Annan, maybe it will happen in Rara, it is happening in Dumfries. But I mean, this is in real terms, because of the licence, a strategic way in which to carry out this procedure if it goes ahead. I know it's carried out in different ways, but we have got an almost like a strategic policy and it's, it's governed by the terms and conditions of the licence, I would have thought. Yeah. yeah. Looks like the officers agree with you. Okay, happy with that. Um, I haven't got any more. So, can we go to the recommendations? Uh, members were asked to, uh, two, to agree 2.1 and 2.2. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't have any other business deemed urgent by the chair. The, However, we do have a, an exempt report, members, um, and I would, I would seek to agree adoption of resolution to exclude the public for the meeting in terms of section 50A4 and paragraph 6 and 8 of part 1 of schedule 7A of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973. Can we agree that? Yeah. I'll just check the record and switch off.